First of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the people of the Turrbal and Jagera nations, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, to, today I want to um, talk about efficient data analysis and reporting, uh, and especially don't repeat yourself workflows in R. And I guess I haven't, um, I haven't got a slick, uh, well, it's not, not too slick, but I've got, I do have a package about that, but it's not just about packages. I guess my interest is, is more generic, and, and uh, I guess not, there's not a one-size-fits-all often, as, as we heard in the discussions just, just a moment ago. And I guess I've, I'm certainly interested in a, dry, um, in a dry model. I come from inland Australia, and I thought my, uh, my uh, international colleagues here, here might appreciate this. This is actually a creek bed. And I think this is about the first time in 30 years that there was ever any water in it. Unfortunately, when I took the, well, not unfortunately, we just had rain. So, so, uh, so there's actually rain in this creek bed, but, but it is usually quite dry um, near, near Broken Hill where I'm from. And I guess the, the, the thing about dry is that we're talking about don't repeat yourself. And, and um, or, as, or as Hadley Wickham sometimes says, having a good sense of humour, do repeat yourself and reuse your code. Um, in, in contrast to wet, where, where I think this is where I come from and where maybe a lot of people started out, is uh, write everything twice or we enjoy typing, that's a, a good one, or waste everyone's time because we don't know what we cut and pasted from the report. Uh, and so um, I think, I think a, a dry approach is, is much better and, uh, and I want to talk about that. But first of all, I want to talk about, some repro uh, about reproducibility in general. Uh, I feel like I'm probably preaching to, to the converted here, but certainly in my, um, in my area of work, which is uh, medical statistics these days, and it used to be agricultural or genetic statistics prior to that, um, certainly not everyone is, is aware of the problems. Um, and then I'd like to talk briefly about dry workflows uh, for data analysis projects, because I've been a consultant statistician for about 30 years, and, and during that time, I realised I was repeating myself an awful lot, even with different projects. And so, the, so the, um, uh, Scott Long's got a book about using Stata for this sort of stuff, and, uh, and he talks about the plan, document, organise, carry out cycle. So we're all quite familiar with that, and it's quite an iterative process. But on top of that, I started using uh, version control in the, in the 90s for, for data analysis project, and also make at the same time. Uh, my, I'll acknowledge I realise I haven't put an acknowledgement slide, so I acknowledge as I go along, but uh, my colleague Bob Forrester uh, introduced those to me in the early 90s, and, and he used them, and, and, uh, and, and quite a few uh, statisticians used those things for a long time. And it was fantastic when RStudio uh, introduced these things uh, to, and sort of in, introduced them to a wider audience. Um, the other thing is, is using uh, R packages and, and functions. If you're doing the same thing over and over again, once again, I'm preaching the converter, but you, but you should, uh, if you possibly can, make a function. And then I'll just briefly talk about uh, conclusions there. So what, what I guess the main thing is, is um, when, when you've sort of been working in this game a long time, you see that a lot of, a lot of uh, there is a re pardon me, reproducibility crisis, uh, and... Uh, but we never quite know the extent of it. So I guess Monia Baker, no relation, uh, did a Dutch study looked at, looking at about 1,500 odd scientists and uh, surveyed them. And so do you think there's a reproducibility crisis? And more than half said yes. Uh, another 38%, another so, so we're looking at sort of 90% there, thought, thought that there probably is a slight crisis and there was only a few that, that didn't. So. Um, I guess that's only a survey, but I have in my own, my own work, I, I've been asked even by the Integrity, um, integrity Office at, at UQ to, to look at theses where the data in the back, uh, I'm sure this, well, I'm sure, well, anyway, it's, it's confidential, but uh, I have seen these theses where, where the data doesn't match up with the, the results, and, I, and we're all familiar with that, and I think sometimes that's a lack of training more than, more than an intentional fraud, for instance, and John Ioannidis, uh, in his 2005 paper said that most published scientific fi findings are false and probably uh, there was a figure just over 50% at least anyway. Um, and I guess par part of the problem of reprodu irreproducibility is that, um, and the, the scientists recognise this, is that the methods and the code aren't available 
Um, raw data is not available. There's a problem. There's a lot of problem if you try and reproduce people's papers. And, and I think the R community, because it is open source, has, has a rather different view about these things. Um, the other thing is, is, is that's crucial is that quality assurance is crucial. So this is, this is more in lab studies. I think it's probably worse um, from what I've seen people do, uh, not R users, so, uh, but uh, what, in general what I've seen them do. And I guess uh, here there's 34% that said that they haven't, still haven't, they're aware of it, but they still haven't established procedures reproducibility. And I suspect that it's higher, that's in the lab, I suspect it's higher in data analysis. And I think that as statisticians and, and data scientists, we can contribute to study design and analysis. That was another thing on the list. Understanding variability, but what I want to talk about uh, for, for the re remainder of the, this time is about reproducible analysis and reporting. So I guess the, uh, the, the workflow that I, that I followed for for quite some time when I, when I realised it needed um, some improving in my own work is to plan, document, organise and carry out. Now if, if you're working with clinical trials then certainly um, you'd know that you'd, you need to do analysis plans um, and, and often before you even, um, you, you've got some idea of the analysis before you, before, when you're applying for the grants for instance. Uh, and certainly you need uh, code books to document variables. Uh, labels, levels, ranges, uh, what instruments you've used, what, what data you'd expect, uh, and, um, and that once you, once you get the data then you carry out the analysis plan, but it's an iterative process because the data may not be what you thought it was uh, or there's, there's some problems with it. And I have found that for large projects, some of them, some of them that go over a number of years for instance, that I tend to modularise uh, the project. So I might have an have a, a area of a directory that I'm, that I'm reading data, emerging data and cleaning data, I might have another directory where I'm doing analyses and, and testing things, and I might have another area where I do reports. And this modularization is very common in computing. Uh, and, and I guess just having a single R markdown for, file will work in, in small projects quite nicely, but not, not in large ones. So, so I guess um, this sort of cycle that, I, that I'm talking about in the traditional uh, manual approach, I guess, a lot. What I've seen a lot, especially in medical research, is um, menu-driven, copy and paste. It's error-prone. It's not audible, or auditable. Pardon me, uh, which is important if you if you want reproducible results. Uh, and I guess a, a more modern dry approach is to use syntax, like I used to use 30 years ago. So automation, version control, and 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 make for build systems. So I guess my my preferences are for. Um, consistent informative project names, file names and so on uh, to modularise the project unless it's, very, unless it's very small and have consistent directory names. Uh, once you start doing a whole lot of projects that look similar, even though they're not the same, um, you, it's, it's easier if you sort of follow the same sort of pattern. And I wouldn't really want to dictate that, but, but um, everyone sort of works in a different way. But I guess we could still use standard well-established tools like writing our own R functions and saving some of the results. So if we've done an analysis, R is great. We can save the objects, we can save the plots, we can save the tables, and then we can print them out later. We might just massage them, but we don't have to go through that process again. We'd, and, and sort of think back, well, two years ago I, I used this bit of code, pardon me, to do, uh, you know, to do, to do this analysis, you can you can look at you can look at the results, especially if you if you um, if you use something like Make, and I know there's other there's other systems around for, for regenerating the output so that you go through a logical step uh, of, of that's dependent on the previous step, and and if you use Git right from day one, then you, then you do have um, a uh, a record of everything, and it is relatively easy to go to go back. Uh, and uh, and so I guess um, to go back if you if you want to change something so I guess here's a sort of standard sort of um, directory structure that I might have and I guess the the main thing that I point out is that for the data um, I've got an original uh, and I try not to touch the original uh, the original data because uh, you don't really want to do that um, and we've got some derived data I've also got codebook code data because I want to use the codebook to actually check my data. And so you can write functions to do that. You can use the tidyverse. Um, I've written a package, but it, it is moderately elementary, um, but uh, did what I, what I want it to do. Uh, and, the, and then we've got other, other um, directories here for reading and cleaning and, and uh, uh, 
having our RMD or RNW files. And, it, and I guess in terms of our own functions and packages, well, they're a re really helpful thing too. And so I put them in a standard place so I know where they are. So this is me working as a solo uh, consultant. Um, but naturally, Git, uh, uh, we can put them on a, on a Git repository and, and, and work in teams when we need to. And we can automate this whole process. So to set up directories, move files to appropriate directories, and so on. And, and we can also generate make files. So there, are, there is the option in, in R, I guess, to write your own syntax when I've sort of written some. I've written, R, um, I've written make file co rules so that, so that you don't really need to know how, how too much about how make works. You need to know a little bit, but, but you can generate these things using a package or you, or you can use them simply and build out your experience. Um, and I can use the information in code books to check data. Uh, and, and that forms the, the basis of the um, dry, dry workflow package. Uh, but I probably won't talk that much about that today, as I realise I'm going to probably run out of time fairly soon. So, so um, in terms of make, um, it's a very, it's a, I know people, uh, so some people may avoid it, uh, and, and um, that's perfectly good too. Drake is certainly a very interesting um, development in, in this space where, where basically, if, if you know make, you can use make directly, but if you don't, you can use R function so that so you can do these sorts of things um, some quite nicely. Uh, but I still prefer to, to be in control, I guess. So, so I have some make file definitions for all sorts of software. And I guess you can look at the, the director to cyclic graph to see the, the, the files in green are the, what I put in the, in the repository, in the Git, Git repository, not necessarily GitHub, because I've got um, uh, confidential data. In, in medical studies, but I'll put it on a server somewhere, and then all the other files can be regenerated. And I can, of course, put them into, into some sort of version at times. I think I might skip over that because the last speaker gave an excellent um, overview of Git. Uh, and I guess with Markdown or, or Swevenida, I think personally that, that these things have, have revolutionized the way that we do reproducible reporting. Uh, and, and they're not really available to the similar sort of extent in other packages. I mean, I know SAS has got its ODS system and, and that's, that's pretty good, but, but I do think that it's changed the way that we think about um, how, how we can produce um, re reproducible reports and, it's, and the, the, the people that don't use this sort of system don't really have that mindset and probably don't realise that, that, it, that it's sort of possible at all. One thing I will say is that you can load objects created and saved in previous steps. So you can have quite a complicated process, save them into a, a binary file, and, and, then, and then load them back when you're doing the report, and that way you're just concentrating on the, on the report, or someone else is concentrating on the report if they're doing that part. And so I guess there's a whole lot of um, R packages that we can use, and, um, and for, there's, um, for code books, we can code it up ourselves using the tidyverse and test that. Those sort of packages or, or uh, code book R. Um, for, I'm sure we'll see um, other, there's some great um, workflow packages. We just saw one um, to, to, do things, uh, to do things for us. The, the dry workflow package can, can create the directory structure, move the files around. Um, even set, even do initialize the the Git repository and actually create. If you've got templates, it, it can create um, uh, template syntax files and Markdown files, um, and and there are other files around. So so that we've we have a whole lot of um, we have a whole lot of um, we have a whole lot of tools at our disposal, and I'm sure there's a there's a lot more around. But I could just I'm sure you probably can't even see it, but but in this, in, this, um, in this project, I've got two CSV files, and this is just a, a demonstration. But if, if, I run, if I run this, I might just uh, make this a bit bigger, if I'm allowed to, no, it's not going to let me. So if I, so if I, um, if I run um, just this, oh, there we go, error could not create. There you go, I, I shan't do the demo then. But, um, <laughs> That's that's how that's how reproducible it is. Sorry about that. But um, so it worked worked before. But uh, well, it, it basically um, 
you can use any any sort of um, methods that you like, whether they're whether they're um, whether you write your own scripts in in whatever language, or or whether you whether you use um, reproducible. I mean, sort of R. I mean, R lends itself to to really write, writing uh, lots of lots of functions, packages, and code. Um, and we and we'll see more today. But um, R really really does lend itself to to automating all sorts of parts of this process. Uh, and uh, and I guess I'll just end up by saying saying that. Um, there really is a reproducibility crisis in science, and it's, it's not just um, not just medical science or, or, or uh, bioinformatics or, or whatever whatever field that you might be in. Um, and often we ne we need to have very thorough um, planning and documentation and organisation, uh, and and uh, and all all this uh, all these sorts of aspects to our to our to our cycle of data analysis, but we can automate quite a lot of it. And uh, it is a personal choice, and it's very hard to, uh, when someone comes along, to, to suggest exactly what they should do because every project is sort of different. But there are a lot of similar similarities. And if we can use a "don't repeat yourself" um, method, then um, then that that we will we'll have a lot more advantages there. And there, as I say, there's quite a few R packages around, including Workflow R. Which must have fallen off the list, and and we can use um, tools like Make, GNU Make. There are alternatives around, but it it really is often quite quite simple to to use uh, Make in the background, uh, especially when your project gets a bit larger and you and you need sort of control over things, version control, markdown, uh, and unit tests, and your own and your own functions and packages. I think I might stop it there. So thanks very much. Any questions? Oh, I think um, Carl Broman's got some good uh, shoots online, but there's there's also um, there's also my J JSS paper when it ever get, comes out when I get back to it. Um, so so there so there are some some resources around, but I do think that that if you use Pattern rules, so so I've got some on GitHub that you can sort of bypass a lot of the worries about make. But make, yes, make can be intimidating, and especially when you get to the get to the really modularized sort of huge workflow if you've got a fairly long-term project. But but it's quite it's quite easy to build it up slowly and. Um, Assuming that my that my uh, workflow package worked, which uh, I'm sure I just changed directories back then. Um, then you then you can get it to set it up for you fairly straightforwardly, and so so you can. And Drake is another one where you've got some sort of tools that you are you're disposable to sort of avoid make. But it really it seems intimidating, but it's a little bit like some people say, well, we should use Python instead, but that means I have to learn a, a whole new language. So so I'd stick with make. I guess is my advice, but that's uh, your mileage may vary. <laughs> <laughs>